welcome everyone for the second session of NVMe Hardware Implementations and Key Benefits and Environments. Uh, I'm actually super excited about this session, not just because I'm chairing it and I'm biased about it, but um, I think uh, one of the great things about this particular session, we've got some other really great sessions as well, is that we're really going to talk about kind of how NVMe is really helping to accelerate specific environments. So we're going to, we pick three different environments a hyperscale implementation, a client implementation, and an enterprise data center. So we're going to kind of walk through that uh, real quick here. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I wanted to introduce our speakers this morning first before we get in, before we get started. So we'll introduce the speakers. I got a couple uh, just public service announcement things to give you guys. We'll jump right into the meat and potatoes of uh, what we're here to talk about today. And if you can, please hold your questions till the end. Uh, if our timing is correct, we should end up with about five or ten minutes uh, of free time to do questions at the end, and uh, then we'll we'll wrap up the session. Sound like a plan? All right, great. So uh, real quick, um, at the far end of the table is Chander Chada. He is a senior technical product mark product manager for Toshiba for enterprise and data center SSD products. In his current role, he defines SSD products to meet advanced enterprise and data center and software-defined storage requirements. Before Toshiba, he worked at ST Micro, Link Media, SanDisk, SanForce, uh, LSI, and Seagate on their HDD and SSD controllers and SSD products for client, enterprise, and data center markets, which has sold multi-million units of controllers and SSDs. Chander manages storage ecosystem forms to enable NVMe SSD adoption and has been a presenter and a panelist on Flash Memory Summit and SNEA Forms. Chander holds a BS in Electrical Engineering from CR State College of Engineering in India, VLSI Technology IT, IIT Delhi, India, and, MB, and an MBA from University of California, Irvine. All right, the next one uh, in the middle there is Chris Peterson, and uh, Chris is from Facebook. He's a hardware systems technology technologist leading flash and non-volatile memory solutions at Facebook. Chris has been designing and building servers, storage, and data center solutions for over 14 years. He has worked on everything from scale up to scale out to containerized data centers. He is now spearheading the design and development of flash and non-volatile memory solutions at Facebook. Chris has led a defi the definition of Lightning, uh, the NVM Express JBOF, which we're gonna we have a track on that later. Is it today or tomorrow, Brandon? Is the JBOF today? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So make sure you check that one out. That one's gonna be awesome as well. Uh, design that accepts uh, NVM SSDs in several form factors, standardizing this in open compute. Chris has evangelized Lightning, NVMe I/O determinism and NVM Express in general. He is a board member of NVM Express and he has been granted eight patents so far. And then last but not least, this is my right hand man, partner in crime on the NVMe board, uh, marketing work group is uh, John Michael and he's a product marketing manager in the Intel non-volatile memory solutions group and currently the product line manager for Intel's data center NVMe SSDs. <coughs> After graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado, he started his career at Sun Microsystems designing storage arrays. He has been in the storage industry for over a decade and has been involved in driving and developing storage industry standards. He is currently serving NVMe Express, as, the, as I mentioned, the co-chair of the NVMe Marketing Workgroup. Okay, so now we've got that out of the way. Okay, so for our agenda today, we're going to talk about, as I mentioned, we really have a, a really good lineup in terms of, of how NVMe is improving. If you were in the last um, uh, session, we really were focused on how NVMe is improving and accelerating from a performance perspective, but also lowering latency across the data center pipeline and also in the client space. So we're going to talk about hyperscale challenges and NVMe solutions. Chris is going to talk about that. And then we'll get into um, NVMe for data center enterprise needs and how NVMe is really uh, helping that um, environment and Chandra's going to tackle that, and then um, uh, John Michael will wrap it up with the client implementations. Um, I Just a shameless plug here, uh, we've got a really good lineup all day today and all day tomorrow um, from NVMe. 
Uh, we're going to be talk, talking about drivers and software. We've got an NVMe over transport section. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to talk about enterprise arrays. We've got, I mentioned the JBOF. Uh, there's going to be specific uh, talk on appliances. And then uh, we had great questions in the, in the um, session before around mm -hmm. testing and interoperability. So we'll wrap up tomorrow uh, with um, interoperability uh, uh, track. So be sure to kind of, I know not all these things will probably interest you, but hopefully some of them will. And I, I encourage you to um, come back and join us. And then the last of the shameless plug here, um, we encourage you to join us um, on and follow us on social media, both LinkedIn and Twitter, as well as good old fashioned World Wide Web. Um, check us out on nvmexpress.org. Um, please feel free to join our mailing list and you'll get all the latest and greatest up to date information and news related to NVMe. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. All right, good morning, guys. My name is Chris. I'm from Facebook. I'm going to talk a little bit about how Hyperscale uses uh, Flash in our data centers, and specifically some of the challenges that we face uh, in terms of how we use the non-volatile memory, and then some of the solutions that we've come up with to help address some of those challenges. So let's start a little bit by talking about how do we actually use the Flash within our data centers. So for us, it falls into uh, three different categories. So first, uh, we use Flash as a, a, a boot device, basically. So we install the operating system on the SSDs. Uh, we use them for the operating system logs as well as application logs. Um, it's, it's a small use case, but at the same time, it's one that's somewhat overlooked, uh, but also rather important because a lot of that logging enables uh, a lot of the application performance and the tuning and debug and so forth, so forth that is pretty critical for uh, running at our um, at the scales that we do. So the other category that we um, uh, we use Flash in today is in databases. And we have a variety of different types of databases that we use. So I'm here on this, uh, on this slide, I'm showing you a couple of uh, uh, databases that we use today. So we currently use RocksDB uh, as well as MyRox, and we have a couple of others uh, that we use pretty extensively. Um, and then the final category that we use Flash in today is for a variety of different caching applications. So that can be anything from content caching that you might see at the edge locations, for example. So this might be pictures or uh, comments or videos even um, that are frequently watched. Um, it could be in the form of uh, small object caching, for example, in front of uh, an array of disks. Um, and then finally, it's used in many uh, forms of indice caching, uh, for example, for search uh, and that type of application as well. So let's talk a little bit about the physical side of things real quick. So uh, on this uh, slide, you can see a couple of different systems. So at the top, uh, we have uh, a couple of different server platforms on the left side are uh, Facebook platforms and on the right are Microsoft platforms actually. All of these are in open compute, so if you ever want to see the gory details, you're more than welcome to take a look at that. Um, but the key takeaway here is that today we're using the M.2 form factor pretty much across the board, um, and that allows us to use this same device in all of these platforms. So at the bottom you can see uh, JBOFs are just a bunch of flash, and as Janine alluded, there's a track on that, um, uh, I think later tomorrow. Um, and all of them basically are able to use this, uh, this common form factor. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the physical side of things and just mention that uh, we use M.2 form factor a lot in, in the form of a, um, on these carrier designs. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, the first one is that uh, it's really useful for us to have a single uh, common uh, form factor that we can use within the, the data center. That allows us supply chain continuity, gives us one device that we can use in different platforms, um, and really gives us the flexibility to uh, use the same uh, device in different applications depending on uh, how the need changes over time. Um, the other benefit here is that uh, this form factor in and of itself is uh, what we consider a scalable form factor. 
Um, and ultimately, scalable is very important to us. With the size of our infrastructure, we need to be able to um, adjust or dial in the configurations that we need uh, with a high degree of flexibility because often our requirements change over time or there's a variety of requirements to begin with. And it becomes very difficult to try and service that with uh, too much physical complexity. So the M.2 form factor has served a, a good role in that sense as it allows us to basically scale capacity, performance, and endurance just by adding or removing the number of devices that we have installed in a particular configuration. So let's talk a little bit more about the types of factors that need to be considered when you're trying to use Flash in a hyperscale environment. So the way I've organized it here is I've categorized these different characteristics or factors into two main categories. One uh, is on the left here, which shows, um, which is kind of a more important to us and then uh, less important to us. Within each category, there's not really any particular order or priority within it. Um, but uh, from a high level, uh, the, the factors on the left are ultimately more interesting to us. So uh, starting from the top, uh, I already mentioned that we're very interested in having scalable solutions, um, and the flexibility is equally important. Um, you know, just from a configuration perspective and aligning that to the different application requirements is important. So being able to uh, map that uh, as flexibly as possible is important. Um, the other aspect that's interesting is that uh, there's only a certain amount of physical space or physical number of slots in a system that you can put. So having a, um, a, a connector, for example, that is very device specific is very problematic for us because then we have to somehow predict well into the future what the optimal combination of these different connectors might be. So it's much more useful for us to have a single common uh, interface, for example, that we can then plug different types of devices into as the uh, requirements change over time. Uh, so uh, obviously we also like to have mainstream and high volume, uh, primarily from the perspective of uh, that we want to ensure that there's plenty of availability for us as our demand fluctuates uh, and we can accommodate that. Then the overall efficiency from a power and a thermal perspective is also very interesting to us. Um, so uh, this is important because ultimately what we're not trying to do is achieve the absolute maximum density per U. Uh, that might sound surprising, but for us, uh, because the density grows naturally over time anyway, uh, as the NAND density is double, um, the ultimate density per U is less interesting because often that ends up sacrificing some other aspect on this list. For example, um, the thermal efficiency of the of the overall system. Um, the other interesting uh, aspect here for us is that we really need to be able to quickly and easily replace these devices, and we need to be able to do so without affecting the rest of the system. So that drives the need for hot swap, that drives the need for easily identifying uh, devices, and for a technician to be able to swap them and remove them uh, and uh, update them very quickly. And then finally, uh, from a performance perspective, we're really more interested in two pieces. Uh, one is the performance per terabyte, uh, and then the quality of, of service that we get out of the device. So uh, notice that we're more interested in those two versus the absolute maximum or peak performance, and that's primarily because our workloads uh, need to be scalable workloads and not something that uh, you know, is a small number of machines with, we're trying to squeeze every last IOP out of it. So uh, now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into a couple of these categories. So I'm going to start with the power and thermal efficiency. So um, like every other resource within a data center, uh, both power and airflow are constrained resources. So what that means is that when you're designing systems or solutions that go into a hyperscale data center, you need to take that into account just like every other resource that you're designing for. Um, so uh, the side effect here basically is that um, is is represented by this chart here. So the the key being, if you look at where we want to operate uh, the data center in terms of from an airflow perspective, you really want to be on the left hand side of this chart. So in this blue rectangle there that says data center operating zone. 
So the implication of that is that basically, if you look at it at the device level, is that there's actually very little airflow that we can apply to help keep these devices cool. So the chart here shows basically the uh, worst case NAND uh, device level temperature in terms of a component temperature on the y-axis here versus the x-axis, which is the airflow over that particular device. So in this example, what I'm showing here is that we've been able to improve the overall thermal efficiency, in this case by adding a heat sink to the M.2, which allows us to move from where the red line is operating down to the green line. So that gets us into a comfortable, comfortable operating region. But again, the takeaway here is um, to be able to do that, we're actually using very low airflow um, and it also forces us to run the devices substantially hotter than you might expect. So we tend to run them much closer to um, the highest operating temperatures versus uh, um, you know, further down the, the temperature spectrum. The other side effect of that uh, is that we need to monitor those devices very closely because if you're close to the maximum temperature, you don't want to run into throttling conditions, for example. So you need to keep a close eye on those temperatures. So the way we do that today is by using NVMe MI. Um, and so we monitor those, uh, the temperatures over MI, and then we can adjust fan speeds accordingly to actually compensate for the localized drive level temperatures. Um, and so that becomes an active feedback loop for us. So the next topic I wanna to come back to um, is the topic of scalable performance. So um, in this chart, what I'm showing you here basically is the total available IOPS across a system uh, at a range of different capacities for that system. So uh, the y-axis here is basically IOPS per terabyte and the x-axis is the total installed capacity per system. So what's interesting here to us is that um, our needs force us more down the line of we need to hit a certain uh, IOPS per terabyte to be able to fulfill the requirements of the applications. The problem traditionally has been uh, that those IOPS did not scale with capacity with SATA SSDs. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but uh, a couple of them basically boil down to the uh, inefficiency of the um, of the SATA protocol, and the fact that you required a translation device, which ultimately created system-level bottlenecks. And so we weren't able to scale up the overall performance as we added capacity to the system. Uh, we don't have that problem with NVMe. Um, since it's over PCIe, and we can basically scale up as we add the number of lanes, as well as we add the number of CPU cores to push as many IOPS as we need. Um, so ultimately, that's, that's solved the first challenge for us, is now we can put a lot of capacity uh, and have that match uh, with the CPUs and scale the performance out from a per terabyte perspective. So once we've solved the IOPS scaling challenge, um, the next is we need to think about how do we go about scaling capacity. So uh, one of the bigger challenges that you have is that as the, dan uh, the NAND densities double, the capacity of the SSDs double as well. In a lot of cases, the application requirements actually don't change that much over time. So what that implies then is that ultimately you will need to share uh, underlying hardware, for example, an SSD. So to be able to do that, um, all of those devices need to be able to uh, share that underlying capacity, but you have to do so without affecting the overall quality of service. At the end of the day, we don't wanna have to worry about which application uh, is working with another application on a fixed piece of hardware. We'd like to keep things simple and just assume everything will work and we can just put it on any piece of hardware at any time. So to do that, uh, NVMe uh, has helped us address this challenge um, by allowing us to use NVM sets, which is something that was very recently ratified. So what this allows us to do basically is to be able to split an SSD into multiple NVM sets, which basically separates the underlying media or the NAND within the device into separate groups and sets, which allows us to isolate them from each other. So then we can start putting different workloads on different sets and therefore uh, we get the quality of service isolation that we're looking for. To illustrate this, uh, we ran some benchmarks. So what I'm showing you here is a pretty typical 70-30 mixed read-write workload. Um, and uh, what I want you guys to take away from here basically is that even on today's unoptimized hardware, which is not yet really uh, fully optimized for NVM sets, for example, we see a pretty substantial improvement. 
So what we did is we took uh, the same SSD, we ran it once without sets and once with sets. Um, and then we looked at the total aggregate IOPS that we got out of the device, uh, as well as the latency distributions. So on the left here, uh, you can see that we got almost double the number of IOPS um, out of the drive once we used sets. And that's purely from this, uh, due to the fact that we don't have collisions anymore. The drive can more efficiently handle the IOPS that we're sending to it. And then also, on the right-hand side, you can look at, look at pretty much across the board, uh, we have uh, overall better read latency um, at all nines, and especially at the outliers, where we have over a 4x reduction in outlier latency. And that really gives us the quality of service and isolation that we were looking for. Finally, the last step in terms of scalability is that now you really want to find a way to uh, take this capacity and map it to multiple clients. And you want to do this in a relatively transparent and software-initiated fashion. In a hyperscale data center, uh, we can't go in and touch and move physical hardware around once it's there. The only reason you ever touch it, basically, is to, to replace something that has failed. That's it. Once you roll it in, it stays there, stays configured in that, in that way, and then you roll it back out after it's um, decommissioned, basically. So you, want, you need a more software-defined approach in that sense. So uh, again, NVMe helps us here because uh, we can now take an NVMe over Fabrics or NVMe over TCP connection, uh, route that from a, a compute client or compute server, uh, and connect that through a storage server, which then maps it to a particular NVMe SSD or uh, an NVM set, for example. So we can take an entire drive or we can take a sub uh, section of a drive and then map that to a client. Uh, and more importantly, we can do that quite dynamically. This is something that we can do on the fly whenever the requirements change over time or uh, we get a new application or the application requirements themselves shift. So ultimately, while there's a lot of factors that we need to consider and quite a number of challenges uh, in terms of how you deploy NVM within hyperscale data centers. The thought that I want to leave you with is that we can successfully address a lot of this uh, just by being able to use innovative and standardized solutions. Um, and NVMe has really provided us with the ability to do that. And hopefully we can continue to keep scaling this in the future. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks, Janine, for kind intro. Uh, my name is uh, Chandar Chara. I work for Toshiba Memory America. I uh, manage the technical product uh, marketing team uh, for defining the next generation products in MRDs and PRDs. And so I'll be talking about the uh, enterprise data center needs and, uh, and how NVMe meets those needs. So basically talking from the device point of view, uh, Toshiba offers uh, NVMe as well as uh, SS, uh, SAS and other solutions. So this will be focused on the uh, ECI NVMe device. So if we look at the enterprise data center today, uh, so what they need from the st storage devices, so, so the, as Chris mentioned that the scale if you're scaling up or scaling out, the storage device should be able to uh, cater to that need and uh, keeping the performance and the scalability. So this NVMe uh, storage devices, uh, as we talk more, that they have the nut and bolts to have the scalability option. And, uh, and the other uh, important aspect of the enterprise data center is the performance. So uh, if you look at the uh, traditional legacy storage devices like SAS and SARA. So SARA is getting saturated at the six gig and whereas uh, the PCI NVMe devices, they have the higher performance uh, uh, options compared to those devices. So one, that's one of the important aspect of the, of the enterprise data center requirement. Another <clears throat> important aspect is the, as we go in the fabric environment where the pooling and the remote access storage is needed, if NVMe uh, can meet that need and what it has all the hooks and features to provide that options. Chris mentioned about the quality of service. So quality of service, 
is more important for the hyperscale data center, but even for the enterprise data center. So the, some aspect, the quality of service are also becoming critical, whereas the outliers uh, in the latency distributions are too far and it improves, uh, it, it, it reduces the quality of service. So NVMe uh, with the new sets of features, they are able to provide the better quality of service. We'll talk more about that. And uh, data integrity. So enterprise data center ha have requirement where the data should be uh, should be a, uh, should not have any errors, and the host should be able to append the data integrity field for the end-to-end -end data protection as the data flow from the host all the way the way, all the way to the SSD and all the way to the media, and it comes back. So the data integrity is also another important aspect of the enterprise data center needs. A fault tolerance. Uh, the high availability, the dual port, if the host access to the device what for one port fails, the, the, the storage devices should be able to provide the fault tolerance in terms of failover. So we'll talk also more about that. So how, uh, how NVMe addresses the uh, performance uh, and the scalability need? So with NVMe multi-core architecture, it allows uh, uh, many parallel threads and many deep queues to be supported. NVMe allows uh, non-locking cores, so basically the, the host cores can uh, issue parallel multiple jobs which are not getting interlocked from the other cores, so it, it helps scale the performance as well as the parallel execution of the jobs, improving the performance. And basically, NVMe has been designed to uh, to take the full advantage of the flash backend parallelism because it, in the, on, even on the front end, it has the multi-core architecture allowing multiple uh, jobs to be issued, which, so it can match. It can take the full advantage of the flash backend, which also has many flash channels and the many flash tie in parallel. So unlike uh, traditional uh, storage SaaS or uh, uh, SATA HDD, which were the which have the limited bandwidth on the back end. So with NVMe, with the front end, multi-core architecture, and the deeper queue uh, depths, it, it allows the performance uh, scalability as well as the uh, performance uh, uh, parallelization. So NVMe, uh, the, it, it's built around the PCI. It's using the PCI as a physical interface. And the PCI interface, it's a scalable interface uh, with the with the Gen 3, uh, right now with the you have one gigabyte uh, bandwidth per lane, so you can go up to wider lanes. You can go from uh, and the Gen 4 is going to two gigabyte per lane. So unlike uh, other traditional interfaces which are which are bandwidth limited, so PCI with the physical interface for the NVMe devices, it allows a uh, higher uh, throughput, higher bandwidth. And, 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 and it offers uh, higher performance. It results in the higher random performance also because your pipes are wider compared to traditional interfaces. And this is directly attached uh, uh, PCI, so you have the reduction in the latency because you have, you're re removing the HBA layer from it and your response time is better, so that uh, that's helps uh, improve the quality of service at the system level also. Uh, and natively, NVMe is is 4K sector size, which is al better aligned with the applications. So the uh, application uh, which are uh, SaaS and SATA legacy devices were the sector sizes were 512 bytes, whereas uh, most of the applications are 4K applications. So you have the your response time or your performance uh, uh, is much better for the NVMe devices. Uh, and we, we heard a, a lot about uh, the fabric uh, remote access uh, storage mechanism. So NVMe uh, with the new features like CMB, which is the controller memory buffer. So for the peer-to-peer -peer RDMA transfers, so remote devices can talk to each other and uh, they can directly submit uh, queues and the data transfer from, from the devices itself. So, so you are you're eliminating the CPU hops in between the the host hops, and uh, 
So you are bypassing those and the devices are able to talk to each other directly and it helps uh, so in the latency and as well as the performance. So this uh, controller memory buffer, there is a persistent aspect of it also. So uh, this is basically the MMIO mode where you can access the data over the bars. And uh, so there is a, the, whereas a PMR is this similar mechanism, but the data is uh, persistent, it's, uh, it's a battery backed. And uh, so controller memory buffer for the peer-to-peer -peer RDMA, for the queuing, for the data transfer, it's, it's uh, really uh, going to be beneficial to improve the uh, performance. Other as important aspect of uh, SRI uh, feature of uh, NVMe, which is uh, part of the NVMe spec, is the single root I.O. virtualization. So single root I.O. virtualization which is allows exposing the NVMe device as a virtualized physic, many, many physical functions. So one device uh, now you can configure as a various uh, virtual functions. So the, for especially in the uh, multi-host, uh, multi-namespace, that kind of envir environment. So you can, uh, you can expose the device and the, the system can take full advantage where it can, it can configure one single storage device for in a different virtualized way. And uh, so, so basically you're exposing the hardware directly uh, is a virtualized device to the system itself. We talked about the, the fault, fault tolerance. So with NVMe being a dual port capability, it, uh, it provides a redundant uh, host physical access and for the failover, and it has capability, uh, reservation capability for the failing host uh, to, to, to move to the different host in case of the one port fails. And so this is another important pass aspect of the enterprise data centers where they, they need the redundancy to be there for the failover. And we heard about the, the quality of service uh, importance, especially in the hyperscaler data center. So NVMe sets, which is uh, coming in the 1.4, so that addresses that specific need. So underneath the devices, uh, basically to manage the, uh, the IOD, which is the making the IOs deterministic, the SSDs have to uh, manage the read operations and separate it out from other slow operations, for example, program erase operation, which will make the uh, response time slow for the reads. So, it, so, so that is a little bit of the implementation side but overall to guarantee the quality of service. So NVMe sets offer breaking up uh, the, having this physical level uh, partitions where uh, it, can, it can isolate the region for the better uh, quality of service. And we, for example, you can put the reads ahead of anything else so that the reads outliers are not there and your latency distribution gets, uh, gets tighter to, for the, as per as the, to manage the quality of service. And uh, end-to-end uh, data protection. So NVMe is uh, fully compatible with the T10, diff and DIX, including uh, diff type one and two and three support. So host, host can either append the, send the metadata to SSD uh, or the, with the, whether the metadata could be located adjacent to the user data or it could be in the separate region in the NVMe itself. Or, or this option where the SSD uh, also does its own end-to-end uh, -end data protection, basically it's a CRC uh, mechanism and checker. So the data is, uh, is it provides full end-to-end -end protection for the silent error as well as any data corruption which may happen within the SSD. So NVMe has the uh, enterprise, uh, NVMe uh, offers full end-to-end -end data protection if we are using this uh, T10 diff and dix mechanisms. So that's it from my side. Thank you. So uh, many of you heard that I actually manage Intel's data center product line for NVMe. So it's kind of fun to get to, to uh, present on the client stuff. Uh, the client product people sit right across from me, so I like to give them unsolicited advice about how to run their product lines frequently. <laughs> um, but. 
So when we were looking a couple of years ago, we actually did a, a presentation about NVMe client SSDs on BrightTalk a couple of years ago. So I haven't modified this slide much since then. So I think the biggest applications for NVMe consumers still remain gaming, content creation, and workstations, uh, specifically because the I.O. requirements are really high. So gaming, you know, unfortunately, the games uh, installs are getting really quite large. Uh, you know, some of the AAA games now are almost 100 gigabytes. So putting it all on SSDs are hard. Um, but one of the things we're seeing emerging is people that are using NVMe or high-performance storage devices in gaming are actually getting better experiences. So there's options for lots of games to apply mods where you have different type of textures or really high-quality renderings that are only available if you have really fast storage. So this is cool. I think we're going to see some interesting use cases for gaming kind of emerging where people are actually developing content for games that you need to have high-performance storage. Uh, so content creation. This has been one of the key use cases for NVMe. So people that are doing are there professionals that are editing video, that are working with audio streams. Um, one of the cool use cases we just talked about for, or that we're going to talk about uh, for our Optane presentation here from Intel uh, for content creation is music creation. So typically when somebody's editing music or they have all these libraries with uh, many gigabytes or even terabytes full of music files or sounds and audio files, so um, a composer now, if you have really fast storage, can have access to that in real time to be able to play and mix sounds without having to pause the track. This is really interesting for creativity. So I think this is underlooked as far as creating new workflows. Um, same with 4K editing. So if you have a fast NVMe device, you can actually do color correction in real time. Whereas if you're on a SATA SSD, even at 500 megabytes a second read, you can't actually read multiple 4K streams back. So there's some interesting use cases for content creation that allow people to actually be more creative. Um, so I think that's really where a lot of the uh, benefit there is. One of the other things creative professionals do is move data from point A to point B. So Thunderbolt and NVMe really help with that, uh, just backing up data from one place to another. If you have a drive that reads six times faster, then you're going to be able to open up the file six times faster. Stuff like opening up Photoshop or Adobe Premiere, anybody who's ever used an NVMe SSD knows it's a very pleasant experience. Uh, workstations, so CAD or design. Again, this is one where time is money. People that are getting paid to do design, I think, deserve to have the highest performance parts. So I think Workstation has started to adopt some of the NVMe parts. Uh, so I really urge people that are doing creative professional work, especially in the Workstation side, to use the highest performance NVMe parts. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the client and mobile space. Uh, you know, it is becoming mainstream. I think we see now about a 40% attach rate of SSDs across all client systems, so across mobile, across desktop, all together combined, about 40% SSD attach rate. I think about 20 to 30% of that M.2 today. Um, so actually, we're hearing from OEMs in the in laptop and mobile space, it's almost 60%. Uh, so we're seeing really good adoption of NVMe in the mobile, and that's actually flipping over much faster than we had uh, anticipated to NVMe. Um, it, now, in the desktop replacement segment, where you're just buying an SSD on Newegg or Amazon and replacing it and upgrading your desktop, we still see SATA pretty strong there just because of the pricing. But uh, I think in the notebook space, specifically with M.2, we're seeing NVMe adoption pretty much across the board from your top OEMs like Dell and HP and Lenovo. So uh, again, coming from the data center side where we have lots of advanced NVMe features and we have fabrics and very complicated topologies, uh, the consumer space is actually you know, very refreshing. Is the, the, you know, people, are, people want drives cheaper, they want bigger capacities, they want to be faster, and they want them to be smaller, and hopefully lower power to fit in, you know, to have better battery life for the mobile systems. So NVMe is a really good scalable storage solution. Um, one of the coolest things about working on NVMe, it's the only protocol I know that actually scales from mobile phones to laptops to desktops to workstations to servers to dual ported servers and enterprise arrays to all flash arrays, actually in all the way to data center fabrics. Same protocol all the way through. So the advantage of moving all the client there is now you have a consistent streamlined storage stack. You get to reuse all the good stuff that we baked into NVMe for the data center, like the multi queue, uh, the good queuing mechanism, the low latency, the storage stack, the standard management, all the standard com commands. You have support. Uh, industry support and drivers and all your standard operating systems. You have Windows, Linux, uh, VMware. You have a bunch of features to manage power and thermals, some of which are more applicable to client, uh, but actually some of the data center features for power, some things like power state descriptors are actually used in client and data center. Uh, and you get scalability with next-gen NVM. As we've seen with Intel Optane and other emerging uh, new storage class memory, 
NVMe is really the, the, the key interface that unlocks the potential and value of these new interfaces. Uh, and then, of course, the built-in security manageability features, things like Opal 2.0, uh, things like FIPS. You can actually have uh, Microsoft eDrive to do inline encryption or, uh, or a self-encrypting drive are actually very similar between the client and data center. Uh, but NVMe has all that built in. So this is a picture of the desktop um, with the mainstream form factors. I think everybody's very familiar with this here. Uh, we have PCIe add-in cards, which have been the most, uh, the standard form factor for PCI Express devices in a desktop or workstation, has the longest history, has the, the best compliance program. Uh, M.2s have emerged, and of course, that is, um, you know, the dominant storage form factor across uh, the client mobile systems, as well as now emerging in the desktop. You can see, um, you know, typical high-end desktops or motherboards are supporting two, even three M.2 slots on the motherboard, um, some of which are uh, actually starting to support 110 millimeter M.2 for some higher performance devices. Um, now, we, back in 2014, when motherboard vendors were looking at what to do for PCI Express, uh, they were putting SATA Express ports on the motherboard, and that never really panned out because... Uh, the, same, the transition to M.2 happened a lot faster. So consumers wanted buy four performance and buy two performance for SAT Express wasn't really desirable. Uh, Intel had some higher power, higher performance devices. We had these U.2 drives that were kind of 15 to 25 watts that don't really fit in that M.2 form factor as well as some bigger controllers. Uh, so we enabled the ecosystem, some of the motherboard vendors to actually have uh, an SFF86 uh, connector on the motherboard that wires out to a U.2 drive. Um, now, I think this was a pretty good solution for by four. It wasn't widely adopted, uh, partially because the cable is ten dollars. Now they're even down to like five dollars. You know, when a SATA cable is fifty cents, it's a really tough sell. Um, but you'll see, I think it's still an interesting uh, aspect or option for workstation and desktop. You can see specifically in, in a high-end motherboard how much board real estate is taken up by three M.2s. And then, you know, one of the things that um, has happened recently is, my, my slide says M.2 mania, as M.2 has kind of taken over desktop and mobile, uh, a lot of interesting solutions have emerged to try to keep these devices cool and from throttling. So if you buy an M.2 device and put it in a desktop and you're running a really high performance workload to it, it'll eventually throttle. Um, as many of these client and consumer uh, M.2s have, you know, SLC write cache, and they're expecting client and consumer workloads to be very small and fit in within the SLC cache. Um, but you, as you saw for data center and for workstation and for high-end gaming, you know, you want a drive that can run at full performance without throttling. So uh, these kind of solutions have emerged to cool the M.2s, which are really neat. Um, you can see all kinds of crazy heat sinks. Now, one of the interesting solutions that I think is back to the super high performance is the emergence of these PCIe add-in cards that are riser cards that house multiple M.2s. Um, so we have our uh, Intel VROC technology, which is our software RAID technology for NVMe, that we can take four NVMe devices and RAID them together in RAID 0 for just insanely high performance client systems. So we've seen some really cool people in the consumer space kind of pushing the edge of what's possible. Um, and M.2 allows us to be, have this really flexible form factor to do cool things like this. Uh, so now in the notebook space, um, M.2 is pretty much used across the board. Now on the smaller side, on the Y series, which is kind of our ultra portable notebooks from Intel, these are using either BGAs and then on the really low end, like your sub $400 laptops, are you still using EMMC? Um, but some of these are gonna start moving to BGA uh, NVMe and we'll show uh, that's kind of emerging in a smaller form factor that will also be suitable for phones. Um, but M.2 80 millimeters kind of the standard for all the rest of the um, notebooks and the high-end gaming notebooks are actually starting to include two M.2 slots uh, and doing stuff like RAID 0 for M.2 and VME. Um, so choosing the right laptop, I think all you need to know is it needs to have NVMe. Uh, so one of the cool things I've seen happen in the last couple of years is now, like I mentioned, all the OEMs are adopting NVMe. You know, consumers are now calling out OEMs that are including lower cost SATA drives in notebooks and people are not buying them or returning them. Uh, and for the ones that have the NVMe model. So that's, that's good stuff. Now, I mentioned, uh, you know, the NVMe protocol being really scalable all the way down to mobile phones, all the way up to, to desktop and servers. Um, one of the, this is a place that I did not anticipate it to go, uh, but you'll see actually uh, SD organization announced SD Express, which is now putting one lane of PCI Express onto an SD card. So now it can do up to, I think, 980 uh, megabytes a second, which is a, a 30, 40% increase over the current SD maximum bandwidth. 
Uh, and there's a session that we are presenting on this tomorrow, uh, not NVM Express, but uh, one of my Intel colleagues, so that you can go to that session if you're interested in, in NVMe on an SD card. But this allows for a couple cool things. One, with the PCIe interface, now you can do stuff that was relegated to software, like caching uh, or a RAID. You can do that from an SD card slot if it's running over the PCIe bus, which is interesting. Another thing that in the future, if you don't care about backwards compatibility with older SD cards, which will happen at some point in time, you can actually save bomb cost on designing the motherboard for not including that PCIe to SD chip. So you can actually route a single lane of PCI Express right out to this SD card slot. And now consumers have an option for bulk or removable storage uh, that doesn't cost them anything extra. And I think that is still the, the trend we see is people want, you know, big capacity, cheap SD card to just throw data on and uh, save it and throw it away. Um, uh, BGA 11 and a half by 13 millimeter is emerging. Uh, I think this is going to be interesting for the tablets and mobile phone space. Uh, again, there are some high-end high -end phone providers that are already putting NVMe on the phones. Um, this is going to keep pushing it uh, because consumers want the high performance. Uh, one of the things, uh, the early arguments maybe in 2014 was that NVMe is not as power efficient as, as SATA. And certainly, at a, if you just looked at it like a device level uh, SATA SSD, they're very power efficient. And um, the SATA SSDs in, let's say, 2013 timeframe started to implement uh, device sleep or dev sleep, which offered a really near zero idle power state. So those power states are available on PCI Express. We have L1.1 and L1.2. Uh, and there's a ton of uh, PCIe low power device features. So some of which I'll talk about the features that are going into NVMe for client. Um, NVMe is already super high performance, so got all the performance the client consumers need. Uh, all the features that are going into NVMe for consumers is all about power management and, and thermal management. So an NVMe device, even though it takes more maximum power than a SATA device, because it's faster, actually will have lower average power in certain workloads. So this is one which was kind of counterintuitive. So a 4K video playback, the drive is bursting a sequential read and the NVMe device does it five, six times faster than a SATA device. And during, after it bursts out some data and reads it into memory, the device goes to sleep in between the reads. So even though it's using more power during that read, it does it much faster and then it can go to sleep longer between reads. So you can actually do a 4K video playback for an hour and the average power consumption is 112 milliwatts on an NVMe device. So they're very power efficient. The idle power with L1.2 and the low power substates are 15 to 20 milliwatts. So we can get near zero idle power. Now even, uh, we'll see in the features, NVMe has included stuff like Runtime D3 to actually pull com the power completely from the drive to have zero idle power um, in the times where your device is idle. And of course, the number one reason that people go to NVMe in the consumer space is for performance. Uh, so I don't think this should be news to anybody. You know, 26x the read performance of a hard drive, 13x the sequential write performance. Uh, over a SATA SSD, they're about five to six times faster in reads and 3.1x faster in writes. And this is uh, our quoting our 760p from Intel um, compared to one of our SATA drives and a, and a standard hard drive. Um, so one of the things we have some bandwidth in PCIe Gen 3. Uh, most of the consumer NVMe devices now, the mainstream ones, are actually hitting the PCIe Gen 3 by 4 bottleneck. Uh, so we've simulated. Uh, at a 256 byte payload size for the PCIe packets, you can do about 3.5 gigabytes a second on PCIe Gen 3 by 4. So if you push that up to 512 byte packets, you can get to about 3.7 gigabytes a second on NVMe with the overhead, and that's about as far as you can push it. So you can see uh, the consumers are going to start demanding PCIe Gen 4s as soon as it's available because that doubles the interface bandwidth again. We'll have a lot more headroom to go for different classes of NVMe devices. So I think as Gen 4 emerges, we'll have this you know, lower end tier uh, you know, of SATA, or NVMe devices kind of replacing SATA, and then we'll still have the high end performance devices that are meant for the enthusiasts and workstations um, and content creators. Uh, just another example, um, you know, as far as the spec sheet stuff, I think everybody's um, in agreement that NVMe is much faster than, uh, you know, a SATA device on the spec sheet on paper. Um, but um, one of the things I heard, you know, maybe two or three years ago that I don't hear as much is 
you know, the jump from hard drive to SATA SSD was so good and the performance benefit was so great that most people couldn't tell the difference or thought they couldn't tell the difference between a SATA device and an NVMe device. And with somebody who's been booting off NVMe devices for four years, I can tell you that's not true. It is much faster, uh, even in standard workloads. Um, this is some data I pulled from a non-tech um, when of Jim taking a, a, a NAND drive that's similar for SATA or has similar NAND uh, versus an NVMe and looking at the application-based performance. And um, they do these trace-based workloads that actually simulate real workloads, such as content creation, Adobe, Office, just standard, you know, standard applications you'd be running. And on average, the NVMe devices are running about three to four X better than a SATA device. So when somebody says they can't feel the difference, I think that that's, that's not quite true, um, especially if you're a heavy content user. Now, if you're just, you know, browsing, you know, a video on YouTube or in Chrome or something, probably not. But uh, for anybody who's doing some serious work on a computer, there's definitely performance. Uh, one of the things I mentioned uh, about the key when NVMe Express was developed, it was developed to be to be able to take advantage of next uh, next generation storage class memory. Um, so here's a proof point that I borrowed from my marketing friends that are doing the Optane technology at Intel uh, for one of the proof points. They're actually comparing a NAND-based NVMe drive versus an Optane-based NVMe drive. So you can imagine this is maybe 20x better than a SATA drive, but um, they're using um, DaVinci Resolve, which is an editing application uh, for video, and that you can do stuff like color correction and, and 4K video editing. Um, but when using our Optane drive, so using the NVMe interface with next generation storage class memory, the CPU utilization went from 30 to 90%. So in this type of application where you don't want the drive to throttle, you want to write high, uh, high amount of data to the drive while reading concurrently and doing these renderings, um, not only did you actually improve the rendering time just because the storage media is faster, but you're actually unbottlenecking the CPU to go off and read the data faster. So this is kind of intuitive too. So if you're um, just by upgrading your storage device, you're getting better utilization out of the CPU uh, that you're buying as well. So this application, they said, you know, 4X faster renders, I have a 4K video, 2.6 better system utilization, I mentioned from 30 to uh, 90%, and transcoding a video 4K, um, 1.5 minutes down to 36 seconds. And this is from NVMe device to NVMe device. So you can, again, probably 20 times faster than a SATA device. So on the feature side, um, NVMe Express 1.2 brought some low power features. We have Runtime D3, which I mentioned, uh, which is the ability to completely pull the power from the drive uh, when the drive is idle and doing it in a safe way. And then the device can report its exit latency and how long it takes to resume from that. So the host can be uh, intelligent about when to put the drive to sleep. Um, the additional power state info, this is uh, the power state descriptors in NVMe. So you can have different active power states and a drive can tell you, I support a 10 watt mode, an eight watt mode, a six watt mode, and then the host can put it in these different power states, and then the drive reports what the impact to latency, what the impact to performance would be, and then the host can intelligently decide you know, what power state is optimal for the configuration it's in. Again, this is one of the NVMe features that is also shared with the data center. Um, in the data center, we care more about what the power cap is because of thermals and cooling. On the client side, they think they care more about the exit latency and kind of running it at a certain uh, thermal optimization point for you know cooling, like in a laptop, for instance. One of the other uh, things that was in 1.2 was host memory buffer. Uh, so this was the ability for the host to allocate DRAM uh, as far as doing stuff like the flash translation layer on the device. Now, um, this allowed for lower cost SSDs. They didn't have to put the DRAM on the board and could utilize host DRAM uh, for the application performance. Um, there's some new features that are going into HMB for NVMe 1.4 that kind of optimize uh, optimize this feature and allow for a little bit more uh, specificity. And then composite temperature uh, is just a different way for the SSD to report different various temperatures. And then um, the device can concatenate and do the average of a bunch of different temperature sensors. So on an M.2, for instance, you know, the ASIC usually gets hot, hottest during something like a random read where you're stressing out the uh, CPU on the ASIC or something like a sequential write where your NAND die are getting probably the hottest because they're all writing concurrently. Um, so this allows you to actually um, you know, correlate the different temperatures you're reading off the device and allow you for one temperature that the host can make decisions on. And their, uh, power, these power levels are indicated in the uh, Git log pages.
So these features um, I mentioned allow us to scale NVMe down back, I mentioned the stuff like the SD cards and the BGAs. These are some of the features in NVMe that are required to go do that because you don't have space uh, you know, for a certain amount of DRAM on these smaller devices. So boot partitions was one of the things we did in NVMe Express 1.3 um, to optimize a bit of the storage area that can be read fast without the full initialization um, to be used for stuff like a bootloader. So again, um, you can remove bomb costs by trying to take away the spy flash or the EEPROM um, to make NVMe more friendly to mobile devices. And uh, it works with the, the replay protected memory block. So some of the functionality that's in the NVMe Express specification that tells you how you can read, uh, certain, how you can access the data, um, and you can write the firmware using standard firmware update. And yeah, all these are in the standard uh, NVMe spec. Um, and I, I did, we did do a webcast on some of these uh, a while back. But uh, NVMe 1.3 uh, introduced host controlled thermal management. So uh, if you have something like an M.2, for instance, that I mentioned is used in consumer laptops, as well as used in desktops or workstations, you may want to manage an M.2, the same device, differently in a workstation than you would in a laptop. <laughs> maybe in the laptop you want to run it at lower power. Uh, maybe you want it to throttle earlier because you don't want it to impact your, your fan speed on your laptop. Um, so one of the things that's implemented in NVMe 1.3 is this host controlled thermal management. So you can set these different thermal management temperatures that are thresholds for when the device throttles at. So this TMT1 uh, tells the host what temperature it should start throttling at, and then TMT2 is where it should really start heavily throttling to where you'd want to really impact performance because you're going over the temperature that, that you want it to. So if you're a device manufacturer, you could utilize these to, to better kind of take a specific drive and tune it to your system as far as thermals and power. And then uh, there's a lot of new features in NVMe 1.4. Uh, as we mentioned, there's eight technical proposals already ratified. Uh, there's only one. Oh, I guess the HMB one um, is, is client. They made some updates to that. But this is really the only other client-oriented or consumer-oriented feature in NVMe 1.4 so far, uh, and it's namespace write protect. I'll let you guys take a wild guess on what it does. Uh, but <laughs> it's used to protect the namespace from being written. So in, in a space where um, I mentioned there's ones where you can do, um, you know, the boot partitions or other types of namespaces for allocation of stuff like a bootloader. Um, some manufacturers maybe just want to create multiple namespaces. So as somebody figured out uh, by reverse engineering the iPhone that they were actually using some NVMe IP in the controller, and the way Apple was doing this was create a bunch of different namespaces uh, for the different protected areas so that they could have user data or the OS data or the image data for the operating system that was um, protected from being manipulated or uh, toyed with. So this could be used in that sense uh, in the NVMe 1.4 specification, which is available today, at least uh, that these technical proposals that are ratified details how you would go do this and the state machines that are required. So that is it. Looks Thanks, like guys. We've got, uh, thank you, guys. We've got some time for questions, about five minutes. So uh, all right, we have a question. You're going to have to speak loud so everybody can hear you. Yeah, good question. Um, so in the hyperscale, we don't solve um, availability uh, at the hardware level. So nothing we use is dual ported, for example. Um, there's not uh, multiple head nodes on a storage server. Uh, nothing's dual homed. Um, and the reason for that is because we solve those availability challenges uh, three or four layers up in the software stack itself. Um, so you have to keep in mind that the scope of the failures that we have to deal with are quite large. So uh, in addition to being uh, resilient to component level failures, so like an SSD or a CPU or what have you, uh, we also have to deal with the fact that the entire rack might go away, right? Or maybe uh, an entire data center hall goes away, or maybe even an entire data center. So uh, when you look at it from that perspective, you have to think a little bit more globally. And so we have to come up with a much more global solution to be able to handle that. So the localized solutions just really add cost and complexity uh, for us. And that just actually makes it more difficult for us to manage. So we prefer much more simple and then uh, go the other direction, right? So we have 
um, many versions. Uh, we may have multiple copies of things, for example, across different regions, that type of thing. All right, any question? Oh, go ahead. Uh, so it's a combination of things. Um, so if you really want, as with any good solution, it requires uh, multiple pieces to be improved, right? So um, it's um, implemented ultimately both within the SSD itself. So in some cases that may be optimizations within the hardware, such as the controller. Um, uh, it's obviously going to impact the firmware running on that device, so you have to partition uh, you know, your address maps, you have to uh, partition your flash translation layers, uh, your garbage collection uh, has to be aware of this, um, that kind of thing. Um, then uh, that also extends into the host from the front end side of things. So you have to do a good job of aligning your queues, for example, to individual sets. So you want to align, for example, submission queues on a per set basis uh, so that you're, you're not creating yet another bottleneck by running everything through a single queue, as an example. And then, of course, you have to map that up through the operating system stack as well. So it has to go through the block layer in the kernel, for example, um, and uh, so that it becomes fully application aware. We've got time for one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, the question is, does NVMe have encryption built in? Um, so there's NVMe uh, security send and receive commands built into the specification. Uh, the specification itself doesn't specify what self-encrypting drive technology to use, but Opal 2.0 fully supports the NVMe specification. So there are many vendors that are supporting stuff like Opal uh, or FIPS 140-2 in NVMe devices today. So the NVMe spec only tells you how to send the commands to yeah to uh, tunnel the, the security commands over, but uh, it's up to the, the device vendors to manage the like encryption keys, for instance, on the hardware controller or at the, at the software level, we have key management software, you know, doing the locking and unlocking. All right, thank you. I think our time's up for today. Thank you very much for joining us. I, again, invite you to uh, check out the other sessions today and tomorrow. Thanks again, everyone.